Hello and welcome to Digital Profile, Art of the Artist. I'm your host, Jazzy Earl. Our channel is dedicated in showcasing local artists from the Kansas City area with a unique perspective about the artist and their work. We hope you will like our channel and if you do, please make sure to like and subscribe and hit the bell notification. In today's program, we are going to visit with photographer artist Richard Hines, who enjoys working in the great outdoors, capturing the artistry of nature at work. Let's take a quick look at Richard's work and then spend some time getting to know him. Hi, my name is Richard Hines. That's Hines with a Z. Most people don't spell it that way. Um, I'm an artist in photography and I've been working at it now for almost 20 years. Um, I like to be out on the high plains shooting photographs or showing them. I'm from Kansas City. I grew up in a small town in Missouri and like a lot of people I grew up taking photographs with little cameras. I had a little Instamatic, I think it was a Kodak 126 or C, something like that, camera. And I was so proud of that when I first got it. About 20 years ago, I started uh, trying to get serious about something. And, and one of the first good, some of the first good photographs that I remember taking were uh, on a trip to a lake. And I shot after sunset, through the sunset and after sunset. and was really surprised with what I got back in terms of the color and the contrast and it really kind of set me back and I thought maybe I should maybe I should work at this a little bit maybe I should make it more than just what photography is to everyone which is we all grew up taking photographs everyone now has a camera in their pocket and they take them without even thinking about them but I wanted to see what how good of an image I could possibly get and so I, I started getting better equipment and I started working with uh, better film, and that's, that's still what I shoot today. I still shoot film. I use cameras that are almost as old as I am, Nikon and Mamiya cameras, and I continue to use those because I like the result. I like, I've been fortunate to get good results, and people seem to like what I, some of what I've been able to put out there. So I've just kind of stuck with it. I'm, I'm incredibly low tech. Uh, I'm looking to capture, put myself in a position where I can 
put together a composition and light and time of year and weather and create or at least capture something remarkable, something that's distinctive. And if I can put myself in that position to see that, my goal is to capture that. And if I can do that and bring that back, it really doesn't need anything more than that. So I've just stuck with the conventional systems with, with film cameras, films and uh, with film cameras. And I, I like the depth and, and, it, and it seems to resonate with people that see it. Uh, they kind of brighten when you tell them that you're still shooting film and they're, they're kind of amazed that, that you can find it, um, which, you know, may not be the case somewhere down the line, but for right now I want to keep doing it. First one I ever took probably was on a trip to Germany with my family and uh, we did a lot of touring of some of the old cities and I remember this this city was like a walled city it had an, it was a medieval German city and I remember looking up and seeing that it had like a, a tower and up on top of the tower in this you know the date on the side of the wall was like 1540 or something like that up on the, somebody lived in part of that tower and up on top I remember there was a TV antenna and there was laundry hanging across it so I thought I got to take a picture of this I remember I remember uh, you know I was just fascinated by how different the country was how different the the, the towns were it was like uh, going to Germany, going to Europe, it was like landing on another planet almost, in, in a good way. It was wonderful, but it was a complete departure from from everything I'd seen and everything I uh, I was used to here in the States. And so it was really a, a wonderfully immersive uh, experience. Um, and I just kept going from there, you know, taking photographs really my entire life until I about 20 years ago got you know some decent equipment and started started concentrating on it and started kind of narrowing it down into what I really enjoy doing. A little Kodak camera and then um, the first serious camera I had was a Minolta and it was a nice 35 millimeter manual semi-automatic and I was so proud of it when I got that um, and I left it behind. I was out shooting a sunset at a lake and I left it sitting in a small camera bag and I came back that night or the next day and I was just heartbroken because I'd lost my first really good camera. And after that though, I went to a shop and that's when I started with uh, with Nikon cameras and most anybody, most any photographer will, you know, they, they, we tend to standardize on, on one type so your lenses fit because you normally can't afford to be supporting lenses and other equipment across several platforms so you stick with one and that's when I, that's when I found my way to Nikon and I've been on it ever since. Um, the cameras I have are just bulletproof. I've dropped them, kicked them, done everything imaginable to them heat cold you name it they go through it and they just keep on going and they're wonderfully they're almost like works of art themselves how well designed they are they're metal they're chrome um, and they just keep on working and you can you can abuse them and they continue to do well I try to, I try to take good care of them but uh, they've served me so well I've, I've put countless rolls of film through them and I, I continue to use them today, that, and I use a medium format Mamiya, and I, uh, I'm very happy with the, the results that I get. I grew up in a small town in Missouri, and I have always liked being outdoors. A buddy and I, we used to ride our bikes, our 10 speeds, miles on summer days. I mean, 10, 15 miles just to go fishing someplace. We'd strap our fishing poles and our tackle boxes and everything on our bikes, and we would go all over to go out to a creek and fish. So I, I grew up in, a, in a, a small town, but on the edge of town, so it was almost like being out in the country with a big yard, pasture around us, 
So it was just a big world to explore, and, and I think maybe that um, that upbringing kind of gave me an appreciation for the outdoors, for natural beauty, which is what I really seek out today in my work. Um, it's almost extensively uh, the natural world. Um, and so I'm, you know, out, as a kid I was also though kind of, kind of shy and didn't say much. And um, so, so those two things kind of went together, you know, being outside was like my refuge and that's, that's really all I needed. I, I kind of broke out of the shy part over the years, but I still am probably a classic introvert in that I like being around people for a little while and then I want to be off stage. Uh, but my two favorite places to be are out on the high plains or someplace in the mountains on the ridge line shooting photographs and then back at an art fair with my chair and my booth set up and people start to walk through and I get the chance to talk to them about the work. Those are my two favorite things to do. So I think one complements the other and I, I like a little of both. Actually, my mother was artistic in that she did a lot of different crafts. She knitted, she sewed, she was a fabulous cook, but she also, um, in the 1950s, she actually ran a, 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 the photographic department, uh, actually the portrait studio slash photographic department. It was, it was more than just a portrait studio, but it was in a, in a department store like a, like a Macy's or, a, or, or you know, something like that. Um, and she, she managed that, and that was a formal portrait studio, like department stores at that time had, you know, it wasn't just a screen and a guy with a camera in front of it and you ran your kids through. They had a little bit of everything, I think, but she actually ran that. I, I don't know really about my father. I, do, I don't think that he had that much of a bent on that, but um, she was also a painter. And, uh, but she taught us to look. She taught us to observe. I grew up observing things and she had a great appreciation for beauty outside in the natural world. Um, in the garden, um, on trips, we traveled. So we got a lot. We got an appreciation for travel, an appreciation for observing and enjoying things that, that didn't cost a lot, you know, that were, that were natural, that were free, that were available. Um, and that, that, was a, that, was a real, that was a real plus, that was a real blessing. Well, I make the joke, I can't paint and I can't draw but I can push a button on a camera um, and there's some truth to that um, I, I didn't go to art school I didn't I started off and uh, you know I was good at math and school and physics so I ended up uh, going to college to get, and got an engineering degree as the path of least resistance and something I thought that I could use and be successful at and photography it was already you know it's everyone's art. It was something I was already doing, but it seemed the most. I was just, I was just driven to. When I when I first started getting back some decent images, I was just driven to go out and try, and capture what I was seeing. So it was it was part observing what was in front of me, whether it was a sunset, or sunrise, or you know a beautiful lake or field or something like that, and I just thought, I couldn't not do it. It's like. I got to try and get this and that was the quickest, the, the easiest and quickest way was trying to take a photograph of it and, and see, see if I could capture it, see what kind of result I could get and it's just been a continual process of exploring and capturing, exploring, refining, you know, driving down that road and seeing what you can come across to go out and wander and explore and you know when I've got my camera um, I think there's a saying some, by some photographer, when I have my camera, I'm fearless. When I have my camera, I'm, I don't know if I'm fearless, but I'm going forward. I'm, I'm going to look and wander and see what I can find. And if you go down the road, enough roads, and get out of the truck enough times, you're going to come across something.
and that's the part that makes me feel so fortunate and so lucky to to have photography to let that to let that come out I, I think everyone has an art inside them it's just a matter of when are you going to let that out when are, when are you going to be able to explore that that art and let it out and find your way to it I I, I never really had like influences from the standpoint of, of another artist or someone that that I look to that um, really set me down this path any one person one or two persons but I had a number of people that kind of little by little helped nudge me this way someone in a you know a guy in a camera shop that gave me some advice and pointed me towards a particular piece of equipment and a guy in a film shop that's that said you know why don't you try this and so it came from it didn't come from one or two people it came from like dozens of people people that weren't necessarily even really doing the work they were just involved in some aspect of photography or of working with other artists and so I got ideas from a hundred different places and I did talk with other um, a handful of other artists that that have since become friends and even had one that kind of mentored me and got me started uh, on, on how to even show my work how to even begin to present it so I, I owe them a, a debt people that were already working in photography and, and, and aspects related to the field of each person giving that giving me that little nudge that idea that then I could then incorporate incorporate into the whole those things any one thing may have seemed small but those things put together completely made it possible for me to do this because on my own I probably wouldn't have found my way to where I am I really like all kinds of of representational art of 2d art um, I have a great deal of respect for for anyone that can paint or draw uh, with, with talent and produce a work I mean they start with a blank sheet of paper and to me that is just that's just beyond compare to what what I do um, I think that, that they can create something out of whole cloth I particularly like uh, pastel work and watercolor work because it's very difficult but back within photography my favorite is photojournalism I think that takes I, I guess I should say that there's two but first is photojournalism especially the work that's been done over the years in black and white which of course became its own art form um, out of necessity that was all that was available for a long time but I think photojournalism takes or, or street photography takes tremendous discipline and patience to always be you've always got your camera at the ready you're always looking you're always watching you've always got your eyes open you're always out there and it takes a lot of patience and a lot of discipline but it's like a slice of life you know you capture things in real time um, historical events people and I just think it's it's wonderful work and I love looking at it it's that's my favorite I don't really like I mean I like to look at other work like mine I guess but if I have my druthers I, I want to open a book of, of old black and whites uh, of street photography or photojournalism and just pour through it and look at the people and the things in the background and the faces and think about the moment in time what was going on when that when that photograph was was captured um, and I also have a great deal of respect for for wildlife photographers in that you know I can go out on an evening or a day and as long as the conditions are somewhat decent I can I can at least shoot I can get something uh, or get an idea of when I'm going to come back and learn something about it wildlife photographers can do all the right things completely prepare and if their subject is not cooperating is not there they're out of luck so it's they have patience and uh, and due diligence that is, is beyond what I do well it's um, most of it is definitely landscape photography as I've 
you know, said earlier, I, I work in film with manual cameras and I have my photographs printed in a, the traditional method, which is what we used to call a photograph, um, the wet chemical wet method. So it's, it's all very traditionally and conventionally done. I do that because I like the result, I like the richness, what I feel is a richness and depth to it in the way it presents. But um, I shoot almost entirely landscapes. I like open places. I like earth and sky. Um, my favorite is western Kansas and eastern Colorado, the high plains. The light is interesting. The altitude there, um, the light's kind of kind of different and the storms come off the front range out of Colorado and sweep across those plains. And the results sometimes can just be jaw-dropping. What, what you get to see, what you get to witness. The colors, the contrast, the shadow, the transformation of light. So I like to put myself in a place with a landscape, whether it's perhaps a wheat field or a field of tall grasses or a lake and put myself in a position where I've got a subject like that and look at my composition and then see what kind of light is going to develop um, and look for that remarkable, that distinctive light. I'm looking to create a remarkable image in the, you know, a, of a natural setting and it's there if you're willing to look for it, you're willing to watch and you're willing to go out enough times, it's there. It's just a matter of capturing it. Yeah, the challenge for me personally is to, is to capture what I'm seeing. And I think it's deserving of that. If you're out there enough, if you're an observer and you go out as, as, as a person that, you know, as a photographer or an artist, and, and you see, you know, the land and the natural world, you're going to witness such wonderful light and color and the transformation of that. I was just, because taking photographs forced me to stay out there for a while. It's not a matter of hopping out, pointing your camera, click, click, and getting back in the car and leaving. You go out, you set up, you're there for an hour, hour and a half. You come back the next day, you're there for an hour, an hour and a half, two hours. You do that at, at you know, all the different times of day maybe that you like to shoot. Maybe you do it all day long. If you're shooting during the day, like with a wheat field or something like that, with the clouds coming and going and the light coming and going, you might, you might be there for two or three hours easy. And because the, the, the day and the light allows you to do that. And during that time, you're, you're a witness. You're, you're witnessing things change. You're, you're a witness basically to, to beauty. And it doesn't seem right to me to alter that. I just want to, if I can just capture what there, what's there, that's good enough. That's, that's beyond good enough. That, it's not, it's partly that it's a challenge and it's fulfilling to me, but if I do my job right and put myself in a position with both, you know, the subject and, you know, the time of day, the time of year, the weather, the light, um, it's, it's already gorgeous. It doesn't need any enhancement. It doesn't need any, uh, anything added or, or detracted for that matter. I just want to capture what's there, faithfully record it, and bring it back for people to see, and then hopefully encourage them to go out and look in the same way. I mean, I, I do pretty much stick with, with landscapes. I like to shoot uh, at the ends of the day. So the light either before sunrise or right after sunrise, the light before sunset or right after sunset, that warm light, the, the artist's magic hour, which is sometimes more like the magic 15 minutes. But when that light is warm and soft and it creates colors and contrast and shadow that otherwise the rest of the day is not there. And you can literally shoot a photograph, I've, I've got a number of them, of like a a wheat field that's been cut already. And so it's just the wheat straw that remains. But for the first 15 minutes of the day, when the sun first comes up, the light is going to warm that and create kind of a reddish, wonderful reddish brown color that's not, that's not there any other time. 
and so if if I if there's a theme running through my work, it's it's I'm looking for that that interesting light, that distinctive light, to to illuminate the subject in a way that otherwise might not take place. And you combine that then also with you know with interesting weather, with a storm that's come through and sunlight that's just that's just breaking out. Um, the, you know, those are just magic. I have found my way to a, to a number of different areas out here in the Midwest. Um, I kind of started just right around here looking at fields of tall grasses and lakes that were in the area. And I just kept pushing my way further west. And I came across these wonderful giant wheat fields out in the northwest corner of, of the state of Kansas that just go, that just stretch, you know, across the horizon line completely out of your, for your um, peripheral vision. So there are a number of, of, of places around the state that have distinctive characteristics and distinctive qualities that really lend themselves to different times of the year. Um, sometimes in the summer if you're shooting a wheat field. Um, in the fall, actually right about now, if you're shooting tall grasses, fall and early winter. And in the spring, if you're going to the Flint Hills or someplace like that. I, I found my way to several spots that I like a lot. You know, I, at first everything was new and I was going to a lot of different places I, that I hadn't been before um, and exploring a lot of little small towns and, and finding uh, old buildings and old barns and, and uh, grain silos and things like that. And I still do a fair amount of that, but I tend to go back to, um, to western Colorado, or excuse me, to western Kansas and eastern Colorado and to uh, shoot the wide open spaces out there. So it, it's familiar territory, but it's always changing. Different, different lights coming through, different weathers coming through, and you never know what you're gonna, what you're gonna get the chance to see and what you're gonna get the chance to point the camera at. So it's, it may be the same ground, but it can be completely different in terms of in terms of what shows up, you know, the light and the colors. So it's continually rewarding in that aspect. And I do like to wander back roads a lot and try to come across something new. I particularly like abandoned farmhouses. Um, there are a number of areas in the state where they actually used to build stone farmhouses. And those to me are amazing. They're just wonderful old ghosts that are that are uh, a link to the past and kind of a standing there as a, as a testament to, to how people once lived. Very few of them are still occupied and lots of times they're in various states of, of, um, of falling apart, but they're beautifully built and they're, they're almost works of art in themselves. So I love that process of discovery. And anytime I come across something like that, I'm tickled to death to get the chance to try and shoot it. Um, there's a shot that's on my website that's called The Gold Below the Gray. And it's, um, it's a wide golden wheat field right before harvest, in fact, right at harvest, uh, in the summer out in Cheyenne County, Kansas. And the sky is just this dark gray cloud. And I would go to a little town out there in that county, in Cheyenne County, and they had a little park. And uh, during the day, I'd just go sit in that park. It's kind of on a high spot. And I'd just watch the sky. And there's a joke out there that you can, that you can stand on a tin can and see tomorrow's weather because the land's so flat. And there's a little bit of truth to that in that you can stand in one place, and I've done this, and see three or four different weather systems at once, just depending on which direction you're gonna look. And so I would just hang out in this little park 
because the storms, they start to, you know, they come in off the front range. They start to form up about one, two o'clock in the afternoon. And I would just pick one and start driving toward it. And this particular day, I was driving east out of, out of the town, out of St. Francis. And there was a storm. And I'm not really a storm chaser like the term is commonly used. I don't want to be in the storm. I want, and I'm not really interested in just photographing a storm, a funnel cloud or something. Those are beautiful, but that doesn't hold a lot of interest for me. But um, I drove towards it. I'm more interested in being on the edge of the storm rather than in it. I drove towards it and I chased that storm for, again, I'm not a storm chaser, but I chased it for like 15 miles. And I would get close and find a, a, a good field or something that I could put between the storm and me, the camera, and with light, hopefully cooperating, light coming from behind. And every time I would get close, it wouldn't quite work. I would shoot a few shots, but the storm kept moving off and it kept moving off. And finally, and it was hot and it was dusty and it was dirty and I was telling myself, this is pointless. I'll never catch up with it. I'll never find a place. And finally, after about the sixth or seventh time I stopped, I came across this big field. And out in the corner were some farmers and they were actually harvesting. They were actually combining and, and cutting the wheat, but they were way off in the corner, but they weren't stopping. And this huge storm cloud is just sitting there and it's basically static. It's just sitting there rumbling. You can hear it. And here's this big, beautiful field, ready to cut, perfectly golden of wheat, tall wheat. And behind me, the sun broke out and it was gorgeous. The sun comes in, it reflects off that cloud and it makes that field glow. And that is a photographer's dream. And so I shot it and out of that series came that image, that gold below the gray. And it was, I won't say it's a one in a million chance, but it doesn't happen every day. You can, you, can go through, you can go through all that effort, and I have many times, and get nothing. You know, you just, the light doesn't cooperate. You can't find a, a field because those things all have to work together. And so I was, I was very fortunate that day. It's a good question. Um, you do really have to look at, you know, a, a lot of people will come in and look at your work and say, Mine didn't turn out like that. I took one, but it, it didn't turn out like that. And you know, a lot of mine don't turn out, but you have to think like the camera thinks, or you have to stop thinking. And, and, and in other words, the camera does not think. The camera is gonna deliver what is right there in front of you. So when you look at a scene, you filter out a lot of things that you don't want to see and certain things become emphasized because those are of interest to you. So your mind will focus on something and that will become more prominent and it will, something else that doesn't interest you will be kind of like pushed back in the, in the background. The camera doesn't do that. The camera is going to deliver right, right what is there. So you have to look at your setting with that in mind. What's the camera, what does the camera see? What's the camera going to deliver? and think about your composition. But I like a clean sight line, and that's what you start with, is, is looking at your composition, seeing if it's clean and it's, and it's, and it's honest, and, and, um, and then you put that together with, you know, what kind of light do I have? What kind of weather might I get? What time of year is it? What kind of conditions do I have? You put those all together and to try and create a good, good image. And it's definitely a process of trial and error. And I, I got a lot of ones, a lot of photographs back from the start that in the beginning that were not very good and that I made mistakes on. And I've, you know, hopefully learned from those and found my way to something that is distinctive and remarkable and faithfully depicts the beauty that is there. I, I don't have anything showing. I just finished some fall shows and uh, I'm looking, trying to actually build my work back up. 
I normally have work on display at an area um, gal gallery or church or some facility that um, showcases artists from the area um, and I put those on my website when I have something coming up. Uh, they vary from you know from time to time and year to year I look to compete in uh, and participate in art fairs in the Midwest each year and but each year each year each one's different because they're judged for entry so most artists just you know they submit their entry they keep their fingers crossed and hope that they're gonna uh, that they're gonna get into the shows that they like those very those vary from you know each year you're not really sure if you're gonna get in it or not so you're hoping to and you find out a few months before the particular show and that's kind of the way that works. The best way is my website, which is lightfollowerphotography.com or it's richardhinesstudio.com. Both of them go to the same place, but it's a display site and I have my portfolio, several different portfolios on there. My landscape images and those that are uh, related to that in horizontal format. There's actually a separate gallery of vertical images that are also landscapes or something related to the landscapes and, and things that I find out uh, in the countryside. And then I also have a gallery in there that's urban imagery, shots from in, uh, in the Kansas City area and related to that. Um, there's a contact page there that allows you to get in touch with me and I'm more than happy to, if we're physically in the same general area, I'm more than happy to make something available for you to see firsthand. I think we all have a connection to the land. When, when I'm showing my work at an art fair and people stop in to talk, they like to talk about how an image reminds them of something. A place that they grew up, a place that, they, that their parents had a farm or a ranch, a place they remembered visiting as kids. Uh, maybe it's a place that they still go to and that they uh, that they like very much. But I, I think we all have a connection to the land and areas that we, that we grew up or that we like to remember or that we still like to visit, maybe some place that we like to vacation. And that seems to, that seems to form a connection. People also seem to like that, that I'm trying to faithfully, that my work is trying to faithfully represent what is there. It's not a separate creation. It's not been altered or changed. It is shot on film. It is printed without alteration. So I think that there's something of an honesty there which is inherent in photography. We all grew up with photography being a record, uh, a depiction of the real world. And I think pe that's something that people still like to see. I, th I think there's an honesty there and that makes them feel comfortable with you know, selecting a, a piece like that. It, you know, th I think there's room for a lot of different types of art, obviously, and if people think create things digitally or otherwise, that's up to them. But this is the right thing for me, and it's the most fulfilling thing for me and engaging. And I'm very fortunate to be able to present that work and, and get the chance to talk to people about it. And, and they, it really seems to resonate with them that it's that it's images of, of the land or things that I find out in the, out, uh, you know, an abandoned house or a structure of some type. Uh, it kind of takes them back to their roots.
Thank you for joining us at Digital Profile, Art of the Artist. I'm your host, Jazzy Earl. If you would like to see more of Richard's work, please look for a link down below. We hope you enjoyed our program, and if so, please hit the like and subscribe button and the bell notification.